The last problem I wanted to look at tonight involves a lawnmower. Yes, that you heard me correct, a lawnmower. I cannot draw a lawnmower, however. Here's my lawnmower. As you can see here, lawnmower. I, it looks like I spelled lawnmower. There, lawnmower. And let's give it a mass of 30 kilograms. The reason that the lawnmower problem is a you know distinct, its own problem in physics, is because it involves a force F being pushed actually down at an angle theta. It's like 45 degrees for this problem. So a lawnmower involves pushing a force down and at an angle, just like how you think of when you know, you're know you using a lawnmower, you're pushing kind of down at an angle, just like the lawnmower goes. We also know that this is a grassy surface. There is going to be friction. And I'm going to write mu s and mu k here because we're going to be talk we're going to be tackling both static friction and kinetic friction for this problem. So I'm going to I'm going to write both mu s I will give a value of 0.7 and mu k I will give it a value of 0.4. So once again mu s is always greater than mu k and in, inherently it comes from the fact that it's harder to get an object to start moving and once an object is already in motion it's easier to push it along with friction. And if I want to know two things. Part A, what is the minimum force needed to get the lawn mower moving? So let's just tackle part A first. What is the minimum force needed to get the lawn mower moving? Think about what's going on here and maybe you've experienced this whenever you've pushed a heavy lawn mower across the grass that you do need a decent amount of force in order to get that thing to start going. And the reason being is because there is static friction involved. Static because it's not moving. If we were to make a free body diagram, well actually before, well, before we even make a free body diagram, we have another force at an angle. It means we, once again we need to split that vector into its components. So I have some force F here going down into the left and I'm given a 45 degree angle here. It doesn't matter where we draw the 45 degree angle. We could also draw it up here if we wanted to because those are alternate interior angles from geometry if you remember. But the important thing is is that we have an X component FX and we have a Y component pointing straight down FY. And at the end of the day we need to make a triangle. Right? We need to make a triangle. We need to pretty much commit to one of these two. I'll make the triangle down here. It's up to you where you want to put it. But here's the right angle and now here's fx now at the bottom. Okay? So if I were to think of what fx is equal to, fx is going to equal to the hypotenuse f times sine or cosine of 45. Well, trick question, but I won't tell you why in a second. The correct answer is cosine, f cosine 45 degrees because we're looking at the adjacent leg of the triangle. And then fy, for that same reason, fy is going to be equal to the sine of 45 degrees times the hypotenuse F. And the reason being, here's the 45 degree angle, there's the opposite leg, it's opposite, it uses sine. And one thing that's cool about specifically 45 degree angles is that cosine of 45 is equal to sine 45, they're both root two over two, so they're gonna be the same. If you mess up with a 45 degree angle with sine or cosine, I mean, it's virtually impossible. It has the exact same value, which is always nice. So now that we have that, we can then draw our free body diagram. Here's my lawn mower. One thing you'll notice with me, sometimes I draw boxes, other times I draw dots for my objects. It really depends on what mood I am in. Today I am in a dot mood. We have mg pointing down, normal force fn pointing up. We have fx pointing to the right as we can see, so to the right. We have F cosine of 45 degrees. And then we also have Fy. Which way does Fy point? Downward, because again, we're pointing down at an angle. So Fy is also going to point down, and that's equal to F sine of 45 degrees. And there's one more force we care about. It's static friction. If we think about which way static friction should point, Remember that all these forces have to balance out for static friction. We're not moving. And the other thing to think about, friction always opposes motion. Which way does this lawnmower want to move when we push on it with force F? It wants to start moving to the right. 
it's not moving to the right because we have static friction pointing to the left. Lowercase f sub s for me. And all these forces are going to balance out because we're talking about static friction. And the other thing we know about this problem is that, well, first of all, do we have an equation for static friction? Well, actually, I should clarify. There is only one time we have an equation for static friction. So the only time static friction is equal to mu s times the normal force, normally it's some number less than this number. Like it's, it's never equal to mu s times the normal force except for one instance, and that's when we're talking about the max static frictional force. In other words, if we were to push this thing any harder, it would start moving. Luckily, if we look at the wording of the question, what is the minimum force needed to get the lawnmower moving? That is exactly what the max static frictional force is. So since we are talking about the max static frictional force, we can use this equation. And if it, we weren't talking about the max, we'd have to solve it in another way. It would probably involve Newton's second law. We can do a problem like that sometime in the future that shows that too. But for now, we have this and we have our free body diagram. Now we need a sum of forces equation for the x or the y direction. Well, if I'm asking for the minimum force and the minimum force points at an angle with both the x and the y component, there really isn't a wrong answer here. So I'm just going to choose x because why not? And so if I have f net y, all the forces going up. I look at my forces, I have fn going up. Why did you use y? I just said x. Gosh, I'm losing it. F net, f net x, all the forces to the right, f cosine 45, f cosine 45 degrees, minus the forces to the left, minus fs max, minus fs max, and that's going to equal ma in the x direction. Now I want you guys to think about, do we know the acceleration in the x direction? Is this object moving? Nope. We, which means the acceleration is zero. In other words, f cosine of 45 degrees is actually equal to whatever the max static frictional force is. And since we have an equation for the max static frictional force, it's mu s times the normal force, and we're given mu s. Mu s was 0.7, we had that at the beginning. If we can find the normal force, we can solve this problem. So now, in order to find the normal force, notice that shows up in the y direction, we are going to need now f net y. So f net y is all the forces going up, which is fn, minus the forces going down, minus mg, and minus f sine 45. So fn minus mg minus f sine 45 degrees. A common misconception here is that the normal force is just equal to mg, and that would be true if it weren't for the fact that we also have the f sine 45 in there. That's going to make the normal force actually a little bit higher, as we will see in a second. Finishing out Newton's second law equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. What's the acceleration in the y direction? Everyone together. Yes, that is correct. It is zero because it's not moving. So now we have Fn is equal to mg plus F sine 45 degrees. We can now plug that back in up here to find the max static frictional force. It equals mu s times the quantity mg plus F sine 45 five degrees and at this point I'd be shooting myself in the foot if I didn't start plugging in. So mu s is 0.7, mass we said was 30, g is 10, that's a quantity, plus f which is what we're solving for and the sine of 45 is root 2 over 2. That's everything we need. What is that equal to? Good gravy. So that's 0.7 times Third, uh, quantity 30 times 10 plus uh, the f root 2 over 2 is going to mess me up actually so we can't simplify this all the way we can break this up into two numbers though like the 0.7 times 30 times 10 0.7 times 30 times 10 that's going to be 210 plus root 2 divided by 2 so plus 0.71 f 
That's what the static friction is equal to, 210 plus 0.71 F. We can now plug that back in right here. F cosine of 45 is root 2 over 2 as well, equals 210 plus 0.71 F. Now it just becomes algebra. We have everything we need to solve. I am noticing that that's going to cancel each other out, so I made a mistake somewhere. Yes, I did. Whoops, I forgot to multiply root 2 over 2 times the 0.7 because we're distributing it. That is a rookie mistake. I'm sorry about that. Times 0.7. That's actually going to be 0.5f. That makes more sense. So we get f times root 2 over 2, which is 0.71f. That is actually plus 0.5. F, and we're going to subtract that 0.5f from both sides. So minus 0.5f. 0.71 coming from root 2 over 2 is 0.71. Subtract 0.5 from both sides equals 210. And so now that's 0.21f is equal to 210, which means my final answer, the force I need to get this thing moving, is 210 times, I'm sorry, divided by 0.21. It's going to be exactly 1,000 newtons to the dot. You can't make this stuff up, even though I did just make this up on the spot. So now we have our force, 1,000 newtons. That's the minimum force we need in order to get this object moving. To put that in perspective to you, that 1,000 newtons is the force you need to just hold a 100 kilogram weight in place. And now you're wondering how many pounds is kilograms because you use American units. And for that one, just, just Google it. So remember, that was all part A. And now we're going to have a part B here. Part B, if you push the lawnmower, if you push the lawnmower with a force of 2,000 newtons, which is just really high, for one second, just one second, how fast will the lawnmower be moving? So hopefully you realize, if I ask how fast will the lawnmower be moving and I give a time of one second, hopefully you realize this is also a kinematics problem as well as a force problem. If you didn't realize that, well then, now you know. That's a huge hint. But at the end of the day, if we were to use kinematics to solve this problem, which we will ultimately, V final acceleration time and displacement like this, what variables do I know? Well, if the thing starts from rest, which I don't mention explicitly, but I should, it's starting from rest. This thing starts from rest because we were just pushing on it and it had static friction, right? It makes sense that it starts from rest. Zero meters per second. V final is what we're solving for because it's how fast we'll be moving after one second. Acceleration, we don't know either. Time, we do know. That's one second and we don't know displacement. So we have two of the five variables we need. That's one second, not 15, just wanna make that clear. What's the acceleration is pretty much our next question here. And we can find acceleration from forces. We're gonna to have to make a new free by diagram, unfortunately. We have mg going down, that f sine 45 degrees pointing down, f cosine 45 degrees going forward, and a normal force going up. That all stayed the same. The only thing changing now is friction. And the only thing that really changes about friction is the name, honestly, because before we had static friction pointing to the left. And now if we think about which way this lawnmower is moving, if I'm pointing it to the right, if I'm pushing it to the right, then friction is going to oppose motion. It's moving to the right. So friction points to the left. And that's going to be FK. So it looks very similar to the last free body diagram we did for part A. The only difference is now we have FK in the X direction. We're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to have F net equations, sum of forces, Newton's second law equations. And we're going to look at the X direction specifically. Why? Because if we want to know how fast the lawnmower is moving, this lawnmower isn't flying into the air. It's not burrowing into the ground. It's moving in the X direction. So we care about the X component of acceleration, which means we're going to first look at F net X here. So I have all the forces to the right, F cosine of 45 degrees minus the forces to the left, FK, 
is equal to mass times acceleration. And again, the acceleration is in the x direction. Let's think about what we know for a second. Do I know F? Yes. We're pushing on it with 2,000 newtons. So that's 2,000. Cosine of 45 is just a constant. It's root 2 over 2. Minus FK. We don't know FK. Can we solve for FK? We will in a second. Equals MA. We know the mass. It's 30 kilograms from, from part A. And we're solving for acceleration. So if we can find that FK, then we have everything we need to solve this problem. So FK is equal to, come on, you remember the equation for kinetic friction. Don't let me do all the work here. I want you to participate along as well. That's right. It's mu k times the normal force. I know you said it in your head. Please tell me you said it in your head. Okay. So fk is equal to mu k times the normal force. We have mu k from part A. We said it was 0.4. If we can find the normal force, then we're good to go. Question, is the normal force the same as the normal force from part A? And the answer is no, because it was part of a different equation back then. Normal force we used from the sum of forces in the y direction. This is how we found normal force in the last problem. We found the sum of forces in the y direction. We're going to have different forces in the y direction because that value of F changed in between part A and part B. In part A, it was 1,000 newtons. In part B, it was 2,000 newtons. I know you guys are getting sick of doing physics right now, but please hang on. We're almost done this problem. And so Fk is equal to mu k times the normal force. We need to go into F net Y, is what I'm trying to say, whether we like it or not. Well, I guess you don't have to. You can just quit watching this video, but I'm going to keep going, and I'm going to be better than you because you quit and I kept going. So, you know, if you're competitive, then maybe you're going for a competitive motivation here. If you're just trying to get through this, then come on, let's just get it done. So we have FK, I'm sorry, F net Y, all the forces going up which is Fn, minus the forces going down. There's just two forces, Mg and F sine 45. So minus Mg minus F sine 45 degrees. And that's going to equal Ma. And once again, we know the acceleration in the y direction because it's not moving up or down. That's just going to be zero. And we can find Fn because Fn is equal to Mg plus F sine 45. It's the same equation, actually, I'm pretty sure, from part A, but with different numbers now. So M is 30, G is 10, plus F is now 2,000, and sine of 45 is root 2 over 2. And we can plug that into our handy-dandy calculator. 30 times 10 is 300, root 2 over 2 is 0 0.7. 0 0.7 times 2,000 is like 14, 1,400. So I'm going to guess the answer is around 1,700. Let's see how close I am. 30 times 10 plus 2,000 times square root of 2 divided by 2. 1,714. That's pretty darn close to 1,700. I'm happy with that. And again, that's the normal force. Normal force, 1,714 Newtons. And since we have that, we can now plug in that to find the frictional force. Mu k, once again, is 0.4 for this problem. And Fn, we just said it, is 1714 newtons. 0.4 times 1700. I'm going to guess that's around 700 newtons. So let's see. 0.4 times 1714. 686 newtons. So pretty close to 700. I'm happy with that. We have Fk. We can now plug that in there. Force is 2,000, cosine 45 is root 2 over 2, minus 686 is equal to mass, which was 30 times the acceleration. And again, we're, we're looking for the acceleration here so we can plug it back into here and use the kinematic equations. We're so close. Let's get it done. 2,000 times square root of 2 divided by 2. Here, let me bring it here. 2,000 times square root of 2 divided by 2 minus 686 it's going to be 728 728 is equal to 30 acceleration divide both sides by 30 we're getting an acceleration a massive acceleration of 24 meters per second squared to put this into context this is like 
if you give it a, a huge jolt of energy to get this lawnmower moving because you spent the first thousand newtons trying to just get it moving in the first place and you overcompensated and you accidentally used two thousand newtons to start moving this object, this thing is going to start moving with an acceleration of 24 meters per second squared. To put that in perspective, that's really flipping big. So that's 24. I'm actually kind of curious what that is in like perspective of humans. I have no idea. Oh well. So now we have all of this. We're just going to plug it into an equation, preferably one that does not have delta x like we see there. So I'm going to plug it into the equation v final is equal to v initial plus acceleration times time. We know v final is what we're solving for. v initial was 0. Acceleration is 24. And t is 1 second. v final is then equal to 24 meters per second. That's how fast it's going to be after we push a lawnmower for one second. Now I can put this into perspective. This is roughly 40 miles per hour, <laughs> which is ludicrous. Like there's no way this makes any sense in a real world application unless you're pushing this with like rocket powered shoes. So definitely didn't choose the best numbers, but you know, that's what makes physics fun, I think. So that's it. We solved the problem. Part B is final speed of 24 meters per second after one second of pushing. And that's it. That's all the physics I have time for today. Thank you all for joining me. And I'll see you next time. I think next topic we're going over, we just finished forces part two. The next topic is going to be conservation of energy. And once you start getting into energy, that's where like physics starts to get real, real interesting. So like if you think this is fun and confusing, then just wait till we get to energy because energy is just going to blow your mind in terms of the doors that it opens in terms of the potential physics questions we can answer. So again, thank you all for joining me. My name is Dan, and I'll see you next time.